Good afternoon. My name is uh, Abdullah Baracha. I'm a member of faculty here at Gibbs. Uh, and as is with every Wednesday that we have uh, in the series that we put together uh, between Gibbs and JP Morgan, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the session. Uh, we're going to have a particularly interesting session today. Uh, and as I drove from my home across to Gibbs today, I found it very interesting in terms of uh, over the last five Wednesdays, I've really looked at and reflected as to how the economy is coming back on board uh, yet we still see a rise in terms of some of the health outcomes from a COVID-19 perspective. And it's very interesting as we navigate uh, the type of contextual environment that we find ourselves in. Today's session is really going to build on from last session. And today uh, I've invited Professor Karen Skippers, who's a colleague of mine here at Gibbs, uh, to spend some time with us really talking about her work in the area of leadership in a crisis. Uh, Karen uh, is a member of faculty. She's um, part of the full-time faculty here at Gibbs. Uh, she's a, a professor in the area of, of leadership, uh, but also does quite an extensive amount of work in terms of teaching, in terms of researching, in terms of writing, uh, and also in terms of uh, presenting some of her short thoughts uh, in terms of leadership. Uh, I find it interesting because a few weeks ago, uh, Karen, uh, together with another colleague of ours, Tracy Tofi, won an award uh, for uh, a leading case on Sweep South in the EFMD Awards. And so Karen... Mm -hmm. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today uh, and look forward to the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes with you. As always, I'm going to ask that uh, you spend uh, time interacting and engaging with us. I will manage uh, the conversation that you have. And so please feel free to ask any questions, to put your comments and to really uh, invite yourself into this conversation as we connect and engage with Professor Skepas. Karen, thank you for coming through and, and look forward to your inputs today. Thanks so much, Abdullah. And it's a great opportunity for me. Thank you so much to be able to share with small business owners about something I'm very passionate about, and that is leadership in this crisis during COVID-19. I'm going to share something very practically with you about mapping. So there are four things that you need to map as a, a small business owner. You need to map seasons, you need to map people, capabilities, and you need to map process. So I love photography and I brought these photographs for you so that you can remember to map seasons. As a psychologist as an, and an executive coach and also as a lecturer here at Gibbs, like Abdullah mentioned, I find it helpful when my clients are looking at the world as a rhythm and that there's a rhythm to life. I hope that when you notice the autumn leaves and the brilliant colors that you will remember that winter is temporary. Spring is coming. I would like to declare that COVID-19 is a season. I think it is use useful for us. It's useful for our psyche and our internal climate to think of COVID-19 as having boundaries. I understand that after 100 days of lockdown, you may feel like this will never end, but it will. This too shall pass. Do not lose hope. I think you as a business owner, you as the leader, your job is to lead and to bring hope. So what helps is to think of before COVID-19 and where we are right now and then also post. So the time we are living in now is about having compassion, compassion for self and compassion for the people working with us and focus now on health and safety. So yes, it's about having hindsight, about having insight and having foresight. I do understand though that this is a marathon and it's not a sprint. But what will be helpful is to think about contextual intelligence. So as a leader, you are the instrument. My research focuses on contextual leadership. I'm fascinated by human agency. I would love for you to lead in the context. You know, they are the context that we have is the same actually, even globally the same. COVID-19, the pandemic is everywhere. But Abdullah, just think about businesses. You can have two businesses exactly in the same industry, the same regulations, but the one leader will see it as an opportunity and the other one as a threat. So how you perceive your context influences how much do you step into the role as leader. When I think of context, I know that context is about time and space. 
the location is important. I would like to invite you to think about opportunities that your location may also create for you. A great example that we have in South Africa is a rooibos tea that grows there in the Sederberg. So it's the only place on earth actually where it grows. And they also realize that it's not just a location, it's also a virtual presence. And therefore that particular company, Carmin Tea, is a born global company because they realize that through Amazon, though that rooibos tea can go all over the world. And also with Uber nowadays, that they are using the whole ecosystem of Uber drivers, the passenger drivers, to also deliver parcels, for instance. And then in terms of the times we live in, yes, of course, the different masks. And I would like Abdullah also to show you his mask that he arrived with this morning. We need to map the people. So yes, we spoke about the season. And the season is specifically the season in your own mind. But now also mapping people. It is important to think about the way that we respond to trauma actually is also norm normally distributed. So on the one hand we have a small percentage people that actually have what I call post-traumatic stress disorder because of what we are in, this, the depression and even being suicidal because of this. And then the larger group will be having resilient, uh, be resilient where they will be the ones that will also have the same symptoms initially, but within a month they look forward and they recover and they carry on. And then there's a small percentage. And my invitation to you today is that you will be that small percentage of the businesses that actually grow through this COVID-19 crisis that we are having. But yes, we need to realize that they are the vulnerable and they are the high risk people with anxiety and depression. And I am very concerned about them and I would like small business owners to please care for them and take note of those that are at high risk in this time and refer them to psychologists and coaches that can help. Also, map the people, let's enhance our mental toughness. I brought for you that uh, fork in the road and Abdullah, you should have seen me also taking that photograph for you on my stomach there, the fork in the road. Uh, trauma is seen as a fork in the road, actually. So in terms of the appreciation of that paradox, on the one hand, you have loss and gain. You have grief and you can move to gratitude, vulnerability and strength. But you know, I wonder, Abdullah, what, what stories will we tell? What stories will we tell our children and their children about this time, this time of COVID-19? Will it be a time when we actually improved our relationships, strengthened our relationships, that we strengthened our spiritual life, that we actually realized that life itself is, should be appreciated. What new doors maybe have been opened? COVID-19, I do realize, is a leadership crucible. But if you look at Seligman and the wonderful research on resilience, I love the positive psychology and the research is showing us that people who don't give up have a habit of interpreting setbacks as temporary. So I say, I declare, COVID-19 is a season. This setback that we have is a season. You know, I would love for us to be able to Im immunize or vac have a vaccine against helplessness, actually. I do think, Abdullah, it's a far, far greater problem than actually the infection we have at the moment. Learned helplessness is a far greater problem. And yes, let's help people to rather think like optimists in this time. If you think of Elon Musk hey, with the SpaceX and how he failed four times before he could send that rocket successfully into space. I think we need to fight the impact of COVID-19 on our own, own minds, in our own psyche and also the impact on our relationships. Yes, we do need to also map the capability. So let's map the capabilities of the organizations. The photograph I have that I took for you here are those plants that, you know, just growing there through the bricks. You can't even believe that, but they're resilient and they improvise. So we must map the capabilities of the business and then improvise. The, world, the word that we use in uh, entrepreneurship research is effectuation. So in entrepreneurship, 
we say effectuation means that you actually use what you have. You use the resources and the context that you have and you make something with it. In agriculture, the farmer just makes a, makes a plan. And just think of also in the townships, eh, how people make a plan and to, to sit on something. You're like, what? Can you realize that that is actually a chair? And those type, and in Afrikaans, you of course say a boer maak a plan. So just make with what you have. So make the capabilities that we have. Now a great example of how people are actually making uh, do with what they have is this the, just the fabrication of all these masks. Eh? So an example is in the textile business, for instance, I've heard about this. Also, it's actually in a township where they are manufacturing nice denim uh, trousers. And they, what they've learned is actually they can use the same denim and now make masks uh, for COVID-19 through it. And other examples that I also brought for you here is that one mask where they actually use the springbok material. Springbok, we, you know, it takes us back to the time before COVID-19 last year with Sia Kulisi and the springboks and how we won the World Cup and how we celebrated. And actually that is quite important. Also, let's, let's go back to 2010 with the Soccer World Cup and the celebrations in, in South Africa. That is actually quite important to also progress ourselves to beyond COVID-19, but also to regress to a time when it was not with us. So map the capabilities. Yes, and of course, this extra, this slide that I give you, you here is keep calm and use the context clues. What does you know, this context actually create for you as an opportunity? But the last one that we need to map, of course, is the process. So what I would like you to imagine is that this business of yours, when it goes through a turnaround and you want to get to the recovery, is that it goes through maybe a growth phase and then if you think of the performance going down over time and then hopefully you stabilize the financials. No, mostly there it is about selling your assets and cutting costs and hopefully the last result then is retrenchments and we can say more about that a bit later and then stabilize the uh, financials and then hopefully there's a growth again and you are at the point where you were before the decline and then what I want to invite you to do is to actually go for true entrepreneurship where you then actually grow the business beyond COVID-19 to, to higher than what it was before COVID-19. But what is important with that turnaround way of looking at the world? And when I teach turnaround, I often say, check out the psychological turnaround. Because what happens with the decline in the financials and the profits that we see in Edcon and so many crises that we have at the moment, is that actually there's a decline in confidence. And that's crucial for leaders to realize because we have to also therefore stabilize people. We need to rebuild that confidence. And you need to rebuild this confidence for, for that type of growth. So what can we do? We need to create channels also for emotional release and for more and more communication. We need to contain the emotions to make space for it. But you as the leader have to stay calm in these circumstances. You need to reassure people, reassure them about values. Don't just reassure them and give them a guarantee for their jobs, but reassure them that even if there are retrenchments, that the way that we will handle that will still be with respect to people and with care. And then regroup the people and then refocus the energy so that we reformulate the steps going forward. So what are good things to say? Well, when there's a decline in confidence, it's important to talk to people about, you know, when, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And when you need to communicate more, let's say, let's talk, let's talk about this, let's create more opportunities for discussion in forums. And then also, you know, uh, when you go through a, a process where you need to actually get people to, to realize, but this is only temporary. This will pass and let's look ahead. Let's have foresight about what's coming our way. 
But what I just love about entrepreneurship is also serial entrepreneurship. That uh, many organizations actually go through a phase where they go through a decline and then up again and then a decline again. And actually, you know, that's the rhythm of life. And with many organizations, that's the way it works. However, it is important to keep going because that's what Elon Musk will tell us as well with the SpaceX and, you know, that they he failed four times. He just, you know, nearly bankrupt there and just went back to it. Somebody that inspires me a lot is Sarah Kumalo. She's the first black woman that summit Everest. And you know, listen to her stories. Please Google, Google Sarah Kumalo. Sarah went back and back and back to Everest four times before she Sarah summited. Read her stories. It is just awesome. But she went back. And that's why at the end of the day, she was successful, but she had to go back. I would like to also, when you think of mapping the process, I would love to share this. And if you email us, we could share these slides with you. The four phases, then when we go through a disaster or emergency or crisis management situation, there are four phases. So yes, you have the mitigation of risk, uh, the preparation, the response, and then the recovery. And that is what we want, the uh, recovery. However, what's fascinating is that with each one of these phases, and that's well known in anyone that is studying risk or disaster management, is that there's actually a psychological awareness and process through each of these phases. So if you look at the first one, the mitigation or prevention, the risk handling through these are psychological awareness campaigns, actually. And that's what we had with COVID-19, you know. Hey, Abdullah, remember that time when they were like talking to us about social distancing and we had no idea what is coming and what does it actually mean? And so there had to be an awareness about, you know, we cannot just give each other hug hugs anymore. And then there was another phase, which was preparedness, psychological readiness then and the planning and how we had to mobilize our networks. And then the next phase, response. So the emergency response and that we now have with extra field hospitals, typical emergency response. But what I don't want you to forget is that there's the psychological uh, response that we also should have, where we need to reassure people we need to reprioritize. Yes, it's about safety first. And we have many examples, and I hear with my MBAs as well, how they told us that the, the businesses and also the corporates just said, okay, we're not measuring sales numbers right now because there's no sales numbers right now. But what we do measure is safety. And the reprioritizing of what we are measuring is quite important here. Also to contain the virus, that's our priority now. Support people also through the trauma. Don't forget that part. And then, of course, improvise. And that is my uh, lucky number. Improvise is the word that I will just take with me throughout COVID-19 and beyond. And at GIPS, we have definitely also learned to improvise. And that's, you know, I don't think I would have been in this studio if it wasn't for COVID-19 because it was not my favorite place. But now I also improvise and I'm here. So in the last one, of course, recovery. So to recover, we need to refocus energy. We need to repair this, our supply chains, repair the supply chain, restore cash flow, reformulate steps and goals, reformulate our priorities, of course. And then I'm, and then I'm getting to the end. You know, in terms of this context, I have many stories to tell. And please check me out on LinkedIn and I do try and share more and more of these stories because they are amazing stories. Uh, just um, a specific one, Jetline in Pretoria, they're close to where I'm at, at Menlin Center, Jetline. What they did was they got their employees to come on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, half of them and the others Tuesday, Thursdays and the others fr uh, Saturdays. And in that way, they kept the employees and they were able to also, you know, they they needed less of them, but they kept everyone still involved in the process so that they don't also not lose their skills in this. It was a jetline as a specific printing type business. And then others would tell you how they had, you know, different shifts. But what is important is to reassure people about the values. Even when they are, it's necessary to retrench people, that you will treat people with the necessary respect. 
and the support. Um, when there's a redeployment, that you will help people to also do their CVs and use your own network to help find jobs for these people. And you know, I want to say something about the Labor Relations Act, but as you know, Abdullah, my husband, Maris Kiepers, he is the labor lawyer, so he often tells me not to go there or not to talk about uh, the Labor Relations Act. But what I want to say about that is more the intention of the act, actually. Because if you look at the Labor Relations Act in South Africa, Act 66 of 1997, it is uh, the aim is actually to promote, on the one hand, economic development and also social justice. So it's both. And of course, labor peace and democracy in the world workplace. Yes, and yes, um, for to adhere to the Labor Relations Act, we have to follow due process and do it step by step uh, in terms of the consultation process you have. And, you know, it's about keeping your evidence, follow your steps, also write a script even, I would say. Write a script before you do that consultation uh, discussion meeting if it uh, comes to the retrenchment phase. Write the script and keep that evidence and tape and record everything you do. But what was amazing is this uh, momentum actually that the working from home movement got through. The, you know, and I was always the one that said, I would like to work more from home. And now I'm the one that says, can we not to please also be more at campus? <laughs> But it's amazing, you know, the, the type of things. And I would like for us to also, you know, look out for these type of things that are happening, um, you know, about like the working from home and working remotely, the whole movement towards working from home. I know also um, a specific company, Sunlam, just said within two weeks, they had to, 70% uh, of their employees just had to work from home and they just did it. And before that, they, they was not, it wasn't possible for them to do that. So I listened to Ian Kirk when he spoke, the CEO, speaking, speaking about how quickly they've actually done that movement. So it is actually phenomenal, the type of things, also the positive things that came out of COVID-19. And I would like for us to also focus on that. But lastly, I would like to end then with, you know, I think there are so many frontline employees and frontline workers, essential workers during this time, that they need us to 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 say to them that we thank them and we we are filled with gratitude with and we appreciate what they have done for us during these last three months uh, you know there a lot of us could stay at home and but the essential workers had to uh, pitch up for work and we we appreciate what they especially the nurses you know, and I, I want to just say that, you know, you may think that Karen Skippers, she talks uh, easily about, you know, being positive about things about COVID-19. As you know, Abdullah, I lost my mother also during this time. So, but yes, I moved from the loss to gratitude. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I do say, though, that we have to take accountability for our internal climate. And we have to take accountability to look at the positive things that COVID-19 has also brought us. And with that, I thank you. Lovely. Bye, Donkey. Uh, <laughs> because we've got people from all over the world. For those of you who aren't call in, that's uh, Afrikaans for thank you very much, to Karen. Uh, Karen, I must say to you that, uh, you know, looking at the comments here, people have really thank found you. value in terms of the authenticity, uh, the honesty, and the very practical way in which you brought brought about the session. So thank you, thank, thank you, you for that. And uh, you know we've got quite a few comments, and I want to loop in some of the individuals sure. from the from the session that we've had. So there's a question from Pemelo Sedumedi who asks the question that you know you've spoken about obviously people losing their jobs, uh, and the question is yeah. very much you know how do we balance this issue of cost cutting mm. versus versus losing human capital? And then I want to link it to a question by Rina uh, Reno Naidu who asks the question. You know, how do you build mm. emotional intelligence as a leader? Mm. Uh, that leaders don't see it only as a winter that's going to carry on forever, but rather that the season mm. will change. And can you build some emotional intelligence to balance, obviously, the cost considerations, but also yeah. the impact on people? Yeah. Thank you, Abdullah. I think uh, those are lovely questions. I would say that, uh, first of all, it is about a, a choice in the leader's mind, first of all, to realize, yes, there must be a cost cutting. I mean, we are, we are very aware of the, the economic situation that we are in. But for me, it's the way we do it. 
Right. So there's, there's a way to treat people still with respect, even if you have to have that discussion with them about that, you know, that specific job. And it's not about the individual, but the job will no longer be needed because of the restructuring that you need to do because of um, losing um, the, the financial backing, for instance. So yes, I, I would say that it's not easy but it is possible to balance it. And the way to do it is that you, you time it for also uh, having that uh, consultation process will be a process. It's not a once off thing, they're just coming that morning and you say, you know, we, we just close everything. That you give people the opportunity to also bring their ideas. Yeah. I have been part of, uh, you know, closing down businesses before, but it was an amazing time for human spirit. Mm. It was an amazing time where people actually carried one another. And the plans that the people actually made of saying rather work half day, but we keep more people sure. just for this time so that because we want that growth again, but we want that entrepreneurial spirit. And if you go there with, oh, you know, and we can't do anything and we have the helplessness, yeah. we will not turn the economy around again. So it is very much important about the, in the human spirit at the end of the day. Exactly. Have, yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Alvin uh, speaks about the fact that, and you spoke about empathy, that how do you, yeah. to your point, really yeah. step in the shoes of somebody yes. else and, yeah. and realize that we're all in yes. this together. You've spoken about the fact that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, and yeah. you've run the comrades, right? Yeah. Uh, and you've yeah. been very active in it's terms a long of time endurance. Ago, <laughs> but I mean, what, what are some of the learnings in terms of, you know, mm. a physical experience like that yeah. and translating it to where we are at the moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for the question. Yes, um, my comrades I've done, but also um, Kilimanjaro. I would say climbing Kilimanjaro was also like that. Right. Also, even um, comrades and Kili, I haven't done it on my own, you yeah. know. So, and I'm, you know, I'm a groupy type person. It was yeah. lovely to be a group of people that supported one another. And I think if we can just take this from today, we're also not in this alone. You know, even if there are people that need to be retrenched, we are still there all to support one another in the process. And um, what I've learned there is to not try it on your own. You know, if you just have somebody with you and you can uh, have somebody to be able to be very honest about your feelings. And I think to create that container and that space for people, that's the emotional intelligence. And I do think leaders can learn that. You know, I, the, my best students for emotional intelligence were actually the engineers <laughs> because they do realize that there's uh, an action and a reaction. And as soon as you start mapping those things for them, they actually understand it. And they, and they, they actually, there's a EQ today. There are many websites. If you go say positive psychology, the Seligman I mentioned and so on, and people that are in interested can also email us and I can send you more resources because it is something you can learn. And for comrades and Kilimanjaro, I tell you, I was top fit at that point in my life. Yes. I'm trying now very hard to get back into it. <laughs> But it was a time that I had to very much focus on getting physically ready for it. But I did not only get physically ready, I got mentally ready. To realize, uh, so Kilimanjaro is a couple of days, Comrades is luckily only one day. <laughs> but it's that resilience to keep going. It's very much about mapping. We are, he we are here now, and this is how far we still have to go. And I think the leaders that I, w I was very um, fortunate to have also on Kilimanjaro, uh, Tribe Safari took us, and uh, those leaders have been there before. Yeah. And I think that experience also, that meant a lot. And they told us, look, we know that when you get to Stella Point, it's the rim of the crater <laughs> at, on Kilimanjaro, you will be as tired that you will think I cannot go any further. But just know, everybody feels like that when they get there. <laughs> and when I got there, I was feeling like that. Right. But I knew, and the leader told me, but Karen, when you get there, and he was patting me on the back, saying, if you can get here, Karen, you will summit. <laughs> and I, that gave me strength. So that word of encouragement, People are hungry for encouragement. They, uh, they are hungry for inspiration, Abdullah. Yeah, 100%. You know, I, I want to <coughs> maybe end with two points uh, and two, two more uh, provocations to you. Uh, we chatted on the phone yesterday and we actually had a conversation <laughs> around, uh, you know, what some downtime or some shift in terms yes. of your daily routines give you in terms of the ability to spend time, as you've said, with family. Yeah. And I find this as a recurring theme. So two weeks ago, I hosted uh, Dr. Charlene Liu. She yeah. spoke about the fact that can you step back and really look at the big picture? Last yeah. week, I spent some time uh, on Wednesday with Professor Adrian Saville in the session yes. where he spoke about the gift of a crisis. You speak about the yeah. fact that what will we tell our children? 
Um, and one of the things that I think is, is this ability to, to really think about how do I uh, think about how do I pull out as much as possible from this crisis. Uh, what have you, you found personally just that has given yeah. you some value in terms yeah. of a shift in terms of, of the reality we find ourselves in? Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, we were lucky as a family that my two grown-up children who actually moved out of the home moved back oh, for lovely. the lockdown. So I was actually very lucky about my son is 23 and my daughter 20. So we're very lucky that they, um, so the family time, I think, uh, was something that I def definitely gained from it. But I even uh, took up gardening. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it was also for my own, you know, uh, for my own spiritual growth, uh, a wonderful time. And as I said, I lost my mother, so it gave me time actually yeah. to, you know, to ha to to uh, to mourn, and and ha uh, take the time to mourn. Whereas I don't know if I would have made the time if it was uh, in the usual rush that we were. At. So I think um, the gardening as well, because that was also where I. Uh, you know, made sure that I um, got uh, silent, be quiet, and be silent. And I think that I will take that with me, you know, and I have a specific bench in my garden <laughs> and, <coughs> I, uh, and, and it stays there. And I think my bench will also remind me. It will remind me of this time. And I hope that I, you know, a time to, to integrate and to consolidate. I think the pause that COVID-19 with the lockdown specifically gave us is definitely something we can take with it. But Abdullah, I don't want people to misuse the crisis that we have. Sure. I want them to, to gain from it, but also not to use the crisis as an excuse. Yes. That they will use the crisis to, uh, for, and keep the humanism with it, you know, and, and still be, care, be careful how we treat people in this process. Lovely. I think those are, are fascinating insights. And if you've been following the series, you'll realize that, you know, a lot of what we've been speaking about last week, we spoke about the ability to pivot, to change business models. Today with uh, Professor Karen Skipper is really this issue of empathy of how do you actually determine what you focus on in this period? Uh, and what is it that we can do broadly as society from a leadership perspective to lead organizations? Uh, I want to end on that point and, and firstly start by thanking Professor Karen Skepers yeah. for your great insights. Karen's come through from, from Pretoria, uh, <laughs> so it's great to have her here in Johannesburg. Uh, I think we've missed her, her bubbly energy here at the business school, so it's great to see you again, Karen, after a long period. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your time, for your valued input, uh, for your contributions in the chat column. Uh, and finally, I want to invite you to next week's session, uh, which uh, I've, I've asked uh, Dr. Manoj Chiba, who's also a member of faculty here at Gibbs, to come and talk to us about innovation uh, and how do companies innovate uh, in a time of crisis. Karen's also kindly uh, offered to send some uh, advices or information if you'd like that. The and email address slides. for us is smmehelp at gibbs.co.za. So if you send an email to us, uh, we'll be able to manage that process. Uh, and then, obviously, this session, the recording of it, will be put on all our YouTube channels, so please feel free to follow that. Uh, on behalf of, uh, of Gibbs the Business School, I'd like to thank JP Morgan for your kind and valued partnership in this process um, and really look forward to the, the remaining parts of the series, and I wish you well uh, over the next week. Thank you very much.